We are I. I thought I would record part two of this podcast in the sauna this morning, just because it seems soothing. There's something about a a wood burning fireplace and you know a cedar structure, a wood structure that just screams hunting, hunting cabin. And although this isn't a hunting cabin, you know, it kind of feels like one, and, all, and it feels like one. It seems like a great place to tell a hunting story in. You know, and being part two of this, I'm probably going to circle back a little bit to the some uh, aspects of part one, so bear with me. The one thing that I love about hunting in Alberta is the sun rises. And unless if you've been to Alberta or Saskatchewan, I don't think you have any idea what I'm talking about. And here in British Columbia, we have some beautiful sunrises, but man, I'm telling you, If there is a God, he uses a fucking paintbrush most mornings to be able to paint the most beautiful sunrises that you've ever seen. Especially on those really cool, crisp mornings in Alberta. And although this wasn't really one of them, again, being minus one with a little bit of wind chill, you know, maybe minus three or four or five. Nonetheless, it still had this absolutely magnificent sunrise. And... When you try to describe it, and even when you try to take a picture of it, and I did take a picture of it and post it on my Instagram, but still, nothing will ever do it justice, because there's just not, there's not words for it, there's not words that you can use to express how beautiful it is, and there's not a camera that can really capture its beauty. But then ironically, I'm looking online yesterday, and I see that some politician in Calgary wrote, you know... One of the reasons why we encourage people to move to Calgary is because we have 333 days of sunshine on average. And I was like, holy fuck, is that real? 333 days of sunshine on average. And it's because of this is the reason why they have you know such beautiful mornings, not the, the cloud cover. And when you don't have that cloud cover in the morning and you can see for, you know, 100 miles... And all that dust in the air from all the farming, you know, and a little bit of pollution in the air from all the industry, all the oil industry. Not that I like that, but it's just, that's what makes beautiful sunrises and sunsets. And I reflect back on that moment. It's the the beauty of starting off these hunting trips is because you're always out there an hour or two before sunrise. So you get to watch this, this beautiful sunrise be painted before you. You get to see every stroke of every color because it slowly happens right before your eyes. And if you're paying attention, it illuminates those those deer, those animals that you're out there to be able to harvest. Because you can't see them in the dark, obviously. And in that morning light, you just happen to see these ghosts appear before you. And every hunter knows exactly what I'm talking about. And even more so in the evening when the sun starts to go down in a hill that you've been looking at for hours and haven't seen anything and realize that it's peppered and scattered with deer the whole time. It's just those shadows you just couldn't quite see. You know, on this on this morning, on these mornings, I feel lucky to be alive. And I feel I feel honored and privileged enough that I've taken the time out of my day, my life, to be able to go out and experience these moments, and not only experience these moments by myself with people that I love, my family. Because the one thing that I was explaining to somebody close to me was I don't know what's the way that I was brought up, or it actually truly does speak to a part of our, you know, our genealogy, our DNA, or us as a people. Or both. But when you're when you're skinning, when you're field dressing an animal, when you're skinning that animal, when you're preparing it for butcher, when you butcher it, when you wrap it, when you're putting it in the freezer, and then all the way to when you pull it out of the freezer, thaw it, and start preparing it. There's something about that process and the people that you do it with really connects you. 
really connects you in a way that you just can't explain. Like this is something that we should be doing together. Like this, this feels really good. We've gone out, we've got food, we've got food that'll take care of us for months and months and months. Is it relief? Is it speaking to our, the genes, the DNA inside of us is saying like, you can, you can be at ease now. You know, not that you can forever, you know, put this food security thing aside, but you can put it aside for a few months. You don't have to worry. You got some food. It's like, okay. And that's the reason why that I go out is for this experience that, you know, even if the people that I'm eating this food with that I've harvested, this meat that I've harvested, even if I haven't, even if I'm eating it with people that weren't there with me, I feel that. It's, it's a totally different feeling than going to the grocery store to be able to get your meat. Like, no, I... I drove, I woke up at one o'clock in the morning. I drove for 12 hours. I spent a lifetime trying to perfect the skill to be able to make it easier when I got there. I laid there awake in anticipation the night before I didn't get any sleep to be able to wake up again at, you know, three o'clock in the morning to get a workout in before I went hunting. To get the body going, to get the mind going, to settle the nerves down a little bit. You know, three miles on the treadmill, then you know another 10, 15 minutes on the elliptical again, just to be able to sell the mind down because you don't want to overtax those muscles because you don't want to be shaky. You just want to be primed up and ready to go. You want to take the the edge off a little bit to be able to settle those nerves down. You know, and then you waited, you lay there, you you froze, you know, like your your fingertips got cold, your ears got cold, your your stomach got cold. You laid there for hours. You walked for hours. You sat for hours. You looked through binoculars and spotting scopes and rifle scopes for hours. Those are all the things that go through your mind when you're sitting there and you provided this food, the sustenance for people at this table. If people are sitting at this table with you and you're serving this meat, you obviously love and respect them. You want to bring them part of your life that means a lot. Like you are my people and I will provide for you. It's a very different feeling than going to the grocery store. And this is what goes back to the actual hunting trip itself. When you realize that your cousin not only took time out of his day, but organized the woman that he loves and a friend that he loves and respects to come out to ensure that we have the best possible opportunity to be able to provide for me and my family. You know, two people that I've actually never met before, you know, came out and, you know, because they love and respect my cousin that much, that then they bestowed that love and respect upon me. And then subsequently my friends and family. And when you stop and you realize those moments when you're driving around in the truck, when you're walking shoulder to shoulder with these people, when you're sitting there freezing your ass off with these people, when you're watching the sunrise with these people, you know, when you're telling stories with these people, you know, you realize the connection that you're building with these people. You realize the admiration you have for the character of these people. You realize that this is, this is how relationships should be formed. And then you realize the shitty version of this now is going out and having a coffee or sitting in a bar having a drink. And it's like, I think this is the reason why that a lot of people feel such a better connection with people when they're playing sports or when they go for a walk or they go hiking or better yet, you know, pack up their gear and go camping in the backcountry. So all these things, I think, tap into that aspect and that element of, of hunting, of getting food, of being transient, flowing with the populations, nomadic. They go all those things tap into and one thing that, you know, it's like when you're sitting there having coffee and drinks, it's like you're at the point now where you've been, you're at the reward without the reward. It's like that's triggering that thought in your mind that you're sitting here with ease, but you're not. Because you're sitting at the point of the reward, the benefit when you actually haven't even went out and sought the accomplishment and achieved the accomplishment, but you're already at the reward phase. It's like, no. 
Like you need to go out. You need to do these things. This needs to be a part of your life. And then again, as I sit there in these fields and I walk around these people, I realize that this is the beginning stages. Going out, waking up early, making the drive, seeing the sunrises. This is the beginning of that benefit. This is the beginning of the benefit of sitting at the table with everybody in your life that you love and respect when you provide this meat for them and you know that they're going to be sustained. You know that you've provided life. And no matter what your living conditions may be, no matter the clothes you may wear or the school you may go to or the job you may have, you've, pr you've provided the basic element of life, which is food. And because you can provide that food, you subsequently have said to these people that you can provide security. Like, think about that for a minute. If you can provide food, you can subsequently provide security. And I think these are things that speak to our soul. They speak to our, our genetics, our DNA, like us as people. Like, I think you can feel that. That is what we feel. Again, this is what I this is what I've come to believe and understand that now as I get a little bit older and I can sit back and I can think through these processes as I'm going through them and especially after and saying like, hey, this is the benefit. These are the benefits of going hunting and providing that food for my loved ones. As I get to see other people be the best of themselves is saying, I'm going to come out and I'm going to help you do that, even though I don't know you, but I love and respect somebody else enough who love and respects you that I will participate alongside you guys. And that's amazing. I love that. And where else can you get that? And you can substitute this in for these artificial environments saying like, hey, I will go grocery shopping with you or I will buy you some groceries, but is generally, it's meaningful but meaningless at the same time. Because what you're looking for is that primal connection. And this is what you get from spending this kind of time with these loved ones. Putting in the work. Putting in the work to be able to provide life. And I feel like you get this same thing when... You go out and you find some fabric, or better yet, you take this, hide this skin, and you, you scrape it, you tan it, and then you make something out of it, and you hand that to somebody, and you've provided, you know, shelter for their body, security for their body. Or maybe you've just gone and bought the fabric, and you've, you've sewn this, you've cut it, you've sewn it, you've made something, you've, again, you've provided protection for their body. Security for their body. Warmth for their body. This is what you've provided. When you provide shelter, when you build a home, when you're a part of building a home, you're providing warmth, security, shelter. You're doing these things. When you do these things with people or for people, I think they speak to the people around you in a completely different way, and especially the beneficiaries. I don't think there's any way that they can't. Because we do know that providing food, providing clothing, providing shelter, the base of this and the understanding behind it is protection and security and comfort in a very raw way. And arguably one of the most raw ways that you can even imagine. And it's beautiful. I think that's the beautiful side of life that a lot of people are missing. And that's the beautiful side of life that urban centers take away from people for the most part. So I know it's a little bit different. This is why I'm saying that I think the hunting trip for this year is a three-part series and it may even be four because this is what I was thinking when I was recording that podcast yesterday and why I wanted to cut it off when I did because it takes a slightly different angle. It's like when you're watching a movie and you see the actions pause and then narration kick in and then the, the actions kick back in and the, the movie continues on and that's what that's what this part two is. It's just saying like, hey, when you peel back the onion skins, it's this experience is so much more than what the face value of it is. And if, if you've provided any of these 
food, clothing, shelter for somebody in any kind of way. I think you know exactly what I'm talking about by recording this podcast here this morning. In this proxy hunting shack, sitting beside this nice, warm, cozy fire. So my question of the day here is, have you provided any of these? And if you have, what do they mean to you?